Well, good evening. Those of you who are, who are here in person, I hope you will find uh, uh, your seats. It is thrilling to see this is our best crowd since pre-COVID. So uh, it's, it's glad to see us many gathering in person. We have well over 50 who have already logged in to the webinar. So I just want to welcome you. I'm Tim Chris, uh, president of the Newark History Society. Um, this program is, to our delight, co-sponsored by NJ Pack and by the Newark Public Library. I just want to invite Aisha Marable to give a, a, a quick welcome on behalf of NJ Pack, and I'll come back and introduce our our speakers tonight and, and lay out the program. Aisha. I don't know if everyone is hugging in this season. How are you? See you. Good evening, everyone. Oh, you can do better than that. Good evening, everyone. Yes, that's better. We haven't been together in way too long, so we want to celebrate. On behalf of John Schreiber and your family at NJ Path, we welcome you to one of our greatest um, collaborations. We love collaborating with partners in the community, and so we celebrate you tonight, but most importantly, we celebrate Newark History Society. We are approaching the 20th anniversary. And so this is like a prelude presentation, yes? We're excited about this season. Those who are with us virtually, we are so sorry you're not here eating all the wonderful food that we have, but we're really elated to have all of you in person. I wanna just remind you all that NJPAC has a wonderful program on October 29th, and you don't wanna miss the podcaster and author Mike Duncan. He brings his love of history to the stage and hosts an informative and entertaining discussion about his new book, Hero of Two Worlds. If anyone is interested in tickets, please uh, contact us. If you are interested in getting some complimentary, contact me. Yes, without further ado, let us uh, have our very own Tim Chris back so we can talk about the program tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Aisha. As she said, this is this is uh, the last program in our 19th year. We reach our 20th year in, in uh, November, and for those of us who've been involved with this from the beginning, that feels like a little bit mild. Uh, but we are uh, so pleased tonight that we can mark the 150th anniversary of the uh, Newark Industrial Exhibition with this program. Uh, we have two presenters. Uh, Guy Sterling is with us in person. Uh, Ezra Shales tested positive for COVID on Monday, but he is joining us via Zoom. It's part of the magic of, of uh, uh, hybrid programming that we've learned since uh, uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, I am going to introduce both Guy, who is going to go first. Uh, and Ezra now. Uh, we will have a Q&A session afterwards. Those of you who are here in the room will bring a microphone, you know, microphone around to you. Those of us, or those of you who are joining us online, uh, please put your questions or comments in the uh, chat or Q&A and we'll find them there. Uh, we'll organize the in person online and see how we can um, 
guy, I, I don't know if you've lost count, but this is the seventh time that you've worked for the Newark Hidden Society on the program. Guy, of course, is a member of the executive committee. He has uh, moderated two programs, the first in 2009 uh, uh, on the legacy of Mayor Ken Gibson, and then he also moderated the program in 2010 on the Star Ledger. But he's also presented on the 19th and high speed uh, uh, factory fire, uh, music, and early 20th century newer um, on uh, Woods, uh, Woods, uh, on Woodland Cemetery as part of a program that we call Gardens of uh, Eternity in 2019. And then in 2020 on Monumental Newer, talking about that more see to think clearly. Citing those different programs shows a range of guys' interest and commitment to Newark um, developed over a lifetime here, but especially over a long career as a uh, reporter and journalist with the, uh, with the Star Ledger. And a really great guy. I know this has been a, 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 uh, a project that has grown heart and soul over the last few years. It's delighted. Uh, Ezra Shales. Um, this is his third time uh, in a uh, Newark Christian Society uh, program. Back in 2006, near the very beginning, uh, we did a program on the legacy of John Cotton Dana. Uh, Ezra joined us on that occasion, and then also for our program on progressive and reformers in the early 20th century, uh, Newark back in 2016. Many of you know him as the author of Made in Newark, and we borrowed the title for this program. Uh, his Made in Newark was, um, uh, I'm, I want to get the title of that film, I put my glasses on. Um, made in Newark, Cultivating Industrial Arts, Civic Identity in the Progressive Era, the Rutgers uh, published in 2010. So it's really the first great book. Uh, Ezra is a professor at the Massachusetts uh, College of Arts and Design. As I say, he will be joining us uh, remotely uh, after Guy's presentation. Guy, let's start with you. Okay. Surface up here. Thank you, Tim. Thanks to all of you in the audience for your interest in tonight's program, both those of you here in the library and those on your electronic devices. I'm proud to be back at the Newark History Society uh, podium with another presentation, especially as the organization approaches the 20th anniversary. The society has enjoyed a great run and the importance of its, wor of its work cannot be understated. especially in an era when Newark's historically significant architectural landscape remains under constant threat. Tim Christ and Warren Glover are to be applauded both for their foresight and all of their hard work in keeping Newark's history alive and vital. Before I begin, I would like to say what a joy it was researching the Newark Industrial Exhibition in 1872. Four years ago, when I mentioned to the Society's board that the 150th anniversary of the Industrial Exhibition was coming up in 2022, I knew the event had been a big deal. But just how big, I didn't come to realize until I started my reading. From a researcher's point of view, the exhibition was a gift that kept on giving, not only in terms of what it was, but also what led up to it, and then what succeeded. The layers of Newark history kept peeling away and only seemed to get more interesting. Finally, when everything was laid out and put in context, I came to understand I was dealing with an event that had national and international implications for Newark at the time, 
as well as one with ramifications inside the city that lasted decades. It convinced me that the 1872 industrial exhibition truly deserves a special place in Newark's history. A couple of things to know at the outset. Try as we might, any number of us who look were unable to find photographs of the exhibition. And no, there were none printed in the newspaper for the day. Maybe there's something under a layer of dust in somebody's attic, but I think it's safe to say that none of the readily available and accessible archives locally and elsewhere has photos of the exhibition, though there are a few line drawings that are part of this presentation. Also, I want you to be aware of a word that pops up here and there in the presentation that isn't in, in use much these days, if at all, but was popular at the time. It's the word manufactures, used as a noun, and essentially meaning objects resulting from the manufacturing process, in essence, products. You'll hear it several times. With this in mind, let's take a journey back to Newark in the 19th century. If ever an American city rolled out the welcoming mat and opened door for business, it was Newark with its industrial exhibition of 1872. Lasting from late summer until early fall of that year, the exhibition was as much a showcase of everything that Newark could produce as it was a staggering display of civic pride. It was as though the city were screaming out, this is who we are, this is what we can do. We think we belong on the national, if not the international stage for our creativity and capability. And it's about time the entire world took notice. There was also a recognition on the part of some leading citizens that an exhibition of Newark's goods, paving the way for a boost in the local economy, could help Newark upgrade in ways consistent with a modern city of the era. That the exhibition succeeded beyond anyone's wildest dream has only secured its place on this its 150th anniversary as one of the seminal, seminal events in Newark's lengthy history, forgotten as the event may be today. In his book summarizing Newark's first 250 years, published in 1917 and entitled Narratives of Newark, author David L. Pearson went so far as to proclaim the industrial exhibition of 1872. Quote, the greatest civic enterprise in the country, meaning in the country's history. Brad Tuttle, in his 2009 book, How Newark Became Newark, called the exhibition an early progenitor of business conventions. What set the exhibition apart was, was that it marked the first time in America a city had showcased itself and nothing but itself, as opposed to a state or a region. Newark's example was not only envy, it was soon copied. The exhibition was also a big enough event that it brought both major candidates in the presidential election of 1872 to check it out. First, newspaper publisher Horace Greeley, followed quickly by the incumbent Republican president Ulysses S. Grant. The visits of Greeley and Grant to Newark, each one generating national news, took place 150 years ago this week. This year also marks 200th anniversary of President Grant's birth. In all, Close to a thousand products brought forth for showing by hundreds of Newark residents and companies were put on display under one roof at the 1872 exhibition. Goods valued 
at more than $21 million in today's money. Items as imposing as steam engines, horse carriages, plows, printing presses, elevators, lathes, and scales that could weigh objects as heavy as six tons. Items as personally useful as textiles, soap, kettles, carpets, clothing, shoes, artificial teeth, and ink. Items as breathtaking in beauty as diamond and gold jewelry, as fragile as a butterfly collection, or as humble as a framed arrangement of pressed flowers, the name but a handful, were laid out or set up for public viewing. Their only common denominator was that they were made by Newark residents or Newark companies. Asking in the glow of its initial success, Newark held additional industrial exhibitions in the years to come. But in truth, seemingly none would have been possible without the widespread acceptance and universal acclaim of the first. In 1872, Newark was approaching the halfway point of its century of unprecedented growth and industrialization. By that year, Newark had more than 1,000 manufacturing concerns a labor force of nearly 30,000, and an annual value of its goods placed at almost $73 million. The city was manufacturing nearly 90% of the country's level. It had more than two dozen jewelry-making factories, summing some of them the best in the world. The banking and insurance companies had taken root and were expanding. Valentine was becoming the nation's sixth largest brewer, and Brock Godfrey Kruger was in town making beer. While major inventors, Kruger, while major inventors like Edward Weston, John Wesley Hyatt, and Thomas Edison were either in Newark with shops or on their way. The late city historian Charles Cummings once wrote of North in this era as follows. Thomas Edison, as a young man in North. Charles Cummings. To produce every type of product known to man it was necessary to have hundreds of factories of every size and shape, from a simple home where piecemeal products could be produced, to structures occupying acres and in some cases, city blocks, each performing a function in the completion of a project. This was Newark in 1872. The city's growth and its increasing trade in this period were greatly aided by the Morris Canal and the expansion of the railroads, five of which connected Newark to New York City with more than 150 trains a day. And of course, there was the the Sake River and the nearby Newark Bay and New York Harbor for water traffic between ports of near and far. Between 1840 and 1870, Newark's population jumped sixfold from below 20,000 to more than 100,000. In 1872, the exhibition year, Newark was the 14th largest city in America and third in terms of manufacturing output. The population boom was largely the result of Germish, German and Irish immigration to the point that by 1865, a third of all North residents were of German descent. There can be little doubt that the surge in industrialization that North experienced in the second half of the 19th century and beyond can be traced in part maybe even significant part to the German influx and the skills the Germans brought with them from Europe. In short, Newark was increase, increasingly prospering after the Civil War, and its residents were chanting at the bit to tell their story loud and clear. Charles Cummings noted this of the period. Everything seemed to favor Newark's economic rise. As the country demanded more and newer products, 
Newark was the provider. It was a story that needed telling too, since Newark was still evolving into a city to be taken seriously as a fully realized center of commerce. Once again, in his narratives of Newark, David Pearson described Newark in 1872 as, quote, an overthrown village in its quaintness, quaintness of buildings, luxuriant growth of shade trees, and the prosaic life of the businessmen and others carrying on the affairs of the daily routine. Newark's lack of urban sophistication did not go unnoticed by those outside the city either. In writing about the 1872 industrial exhibition and its opening, the New York Times had this lengthy description of the city. Newark has been for many years the head headquarters of the manufacturing interests of the state. It does an immense trade in jewelry, ironwork, harness, leather, and trunks. Yet, it has always been backward in stimulating enterprises that have made so many of the cities and towns of Europe and France, I'm sorry, of England and France, celebrated the world over. It has even been lacking in the very commonest requirements of a populous city. Until quite recently, a way-worn traveler might walk from one end of it to the other without being able to find a decent hotel. A gentleman, now of Edwin Booth's acting company, once tried to establish a first-class comedy theater here, but Norkers preferred, preferred to come to New York, and the result was that he met with a very severe loss. The Times continued in its description of Newark in 1872. It has facilities for bathing, but no public baths. The city hall was formerly a hotel, and there's only one police station, although a great deal of time is lost in relieving the watches at night, much to the satisfaction of burglars and evil disposed persons. Most of the streets are paved with the old fashioned cobblestones, the travel over which, at a fast pace, would not be without danger. For old people. The paper, however, concluded with a note of optimism, saying this of the motivation behind the exhibition. Considering that there are so many drawbacks, it is pleasant to observe that the prominent men on whom rests the responsibility of such a state of things are at last awakening to a sense of their duty. There was also a strong moral component underpinning the exhibition. One made demonstrably clear in events opening and closing night speeches. My reading of this moral element, religious if you like, is essentially this. That Newark was a city thought to be divinely blessed in its location and its natural resources. Divinely blessed in a way it had developed since its founding divinely blessed with clean, honest government, and divinely blessed in the talents, skills, and intelligence of its population, both native-born and immigrant, people who aspire to a higher standing in life, through work and a desire to do better. The belief held that working hard and being proud of whatever it was you made achieved the dual goals of benefiting society and serving God. Yes, the exhibition's organizers were rightfully proud that Newark's industrial products were more diverse than those of any city in America, and that Newark's goods were in use throughout the world. But there was more to their thinking, namely, that Newark made products, including its arts and crafts, should be and needed to be recognized as the best of their kind, because they were the creations of an, of an an enlightened and highly skilled population. Historian Charles Cummings had this in mind when he described the exhibits at the 1872 Industrial Exhibition as follows. 
give any one impression beyond all others. If any one impression beyond all others was left in the visitors' minds, it was the perfection of Newark Park. Well, the pioneering local inventor and recently deceased Seth Boyden was repeatedly singled out in the keynote speeches as the father of Newark industry and a role model for citizens to follow in their manufacturing pursuits. Service to a higher calling was also a theme that echoed throughout the exhibition's official remarks. This then, from every indication, was the Protestant work ethic on full display. It was against this local backdrop and an accompanying out-of-town snobbery that the first industrial exhibition was conceived and held in Newark in 1872. In actuality, the idea of an, of an industrial exhibition in Newark had been percolating in the city for a while, since, since this was an era of such events that dated their origins to the Crystal Palace exhibition in London in 1851 and peaked in the 19th century with the world's Columbian exposition in Chicago in 1893 that drew 27 people. In the years before 1872, manufacturers in Newark had mostly used the city's Fourth of July, annual Fourth of July parade to display their products on floats and stages, not exactly ideal settings. There were also occasional ad hoc in industrial displays and bigwigs like President Andrew Jackson, General Lafayette, and Henry Clay came visiting in the 1820s and the 1830s. When the momentum for an industrial exhibition finally built to a head in 1872, the event came together in short order. The decision by a group of private citizens to move forward with the project was made in April, and it was decided to waste no time in mounting an exhibition to begin that August, a mere four months later. The event was to be timed specifically to coincide with the period when New York City was experiencing its annual influx of buyers for the fall and winter seasons. The idea was to entice them over to Newark with something to see, to touch, and hopefully purchase, or perhaps just to get them to stop by the offices and showrooms that a number of Newark businesses had in New York. As an example of how compact the schedule was for moving the exhibition along, an overture from the city's from the exhibition's organizers to determine what, if any, the city could offer the event was only forwarded to City Hall that June. Unfortunately, nothing exists in city archives today to indicate whether the, the city fathers ever did anything more than form a committee to study the proposition, leaving open the possibility that that's all there is. Quite frankly, it wouldn't have mattered much since the event was going ahead full steam with or without city support. Still, money was needed to stage the exhibition as were an organization to oversee the event, some expeditious planning, and a venue to say nothing of exhibitors and exhibits. From the outset, the idea was not without its naysayers. It's safe to say that more people felt the exhibition was either doomed to fail or too risky even to undertake than there were who were confident of its success. Without the support and encouragement of some of the city's elite at the time, people like Marcus Ward, Thomas Petty, Cortland Parker, and General Thomas Runyon, along with established manufacturing firms and building contractors like Hughes and Phillips, Meeker and Hedden, and Watts Campbell, it's possible the, ex the exhibition may never have moved on square one. To get around the apathy and skepticism, organizers decided to appeal directly to Newark's residents for backing. They did so by calling a public meeting on April 3rd, 1872, a meeting promoted in advance by a flyer that was circulated around the city, as well in a newspaper insert. Mayor Frederick W. Rickard 
a member of an intriguing family for anyone interested in Newark's mayoral history, presided over that meeting, and while doing so, gave the exhibition his endorsement. The meeting ended with, an ex with a resolution unanimously supporting the enterprise and the beginning of an all-out fundraising drive. Two weeks later, a 34-member board of managers was elected from among those who had put up $25 a head to underwrite the exhibition as so-called subscribers. Shortly thereafter, six permanent officers were elected, including Marcus Ward as its president and Thomas Petty as first vice president. Albert M. Holbrook, a publisher who put out the annual city directory at the time, was chosen secretary, and it was Holbrook who essentially ran the exhibition on a day-to-day -day basis and later received much of the credit for its success. As the exhibition was ending, he was awarded a day's box office receipts for his efforts. Choosing an, choosing an event site was near the top of the list to do next. Organizers moved quickly in selecting a venue known as the Rink to hold the exhibition. It was located on Washington Street oh. between Fort Street to the north and the long gone Marshall Street to the south, pretty much where the old Star Ledger building stands today. The entrance faced Washington Street near Marshall Street, so in the back of the far slide, it's the back of the Star Ledger building. The area is almost entirely changed now, a result of the urban renewal initiatives in the early 1960s promoted by the powerful North housing official, Louis Danson. The rink had been built a couple of years after the end of the Civil War by William Beckner, a German-American businessman from Milwaukee, who put up several similar buildings in cities like Newark that enjoyed a sizable German-American population. It was constructed as a three-story facility primarily to host roller skating, except that the popularity of roller skating faded in a few short years after these buildings were erected and they were left looking to host other types of events. But it soon became apparent that the rink with its 30,000 square feet of display room probably wasn't going to be big enough to accommodate the industrial exhibition's space needs. That problem was resolved when Joseph Meeker of the distinguished construction company, Meeker and Hedden, generously stepped forward and offered to build two wings onto the rink, adding 20,000 square feet of exhibition space to this, with reimbursement not due him until the exhibition was over. Amazingly enough, the work was completed on time, but the whole production was rushed, leaving organizers wondering if they would, it would be able to open the exhibition on August 20th as promised. So as not to disappoint the public, they went ahead with that date as their opening night, even though not all of the exhibitors were ready for all the exhibits in place as of that date. And in fact, any number of the displays move in and out of the ring over the course of the event. In addition to exhibiting manufacturing and handmade products, organizers were resolute in their desire to emphasize Newark's cultural side by making sure the city's artists and craftspeople had a place to showcase their work. As it just so happened, two of the Newark residents who exhibit pieces are recognized today as among America's greatest artists. The landscape painter, Thomas Moran, and the portrait artist, Lily Martin Spencer. Spencer, who was brought to Newark by Marcus Ward to paint portraits of his children and stayed, exhibited three paintings, including the one she considered her masterpiece, Truth Unveiling Falsehood. A painting of Moran's that was shown at the exhibition was entitled Children of the Mountain. As an aside, 
Last year, the North Museum of Art sold a magnificent painting of the Grand Canyon by Thomas Moran for a hefty sum during the controversial deaccession of its artwork. And I wonder if it was aware that Moran had lived any number of years in Newark, including some during the time he made his famous excursion to what became Yellowstone National Park. Mayor Rickard's daughter, Sophie, sculpted a life-size bust of her father that was put on display and received its fair share of attention in the press. There were also busts of Abraham Lincoln in bronze and in wax. Displaying drawings was Jeremiah O'Rourke, celebrated Irish-born architect who had a hand in designing the Basilica of the Sacred Heart in New York, among other buildings in the city. A supervising architect for the U.S. Treasury, he also designed any number of buildings for the federal government throughout the country. The, far, uh, the picture on the far side of the slide is the old Warren Street School that NJIT not a couple years ago. There were also exhibitors and exhibits, also other exhibitors and exhibits worth mentioning. In anticipation of the question, one of them was not Tiffany and Company, which did not open its North plant until the 1890s. One of the more celebrated exhibitors was Durand, a jewelry making business owned by generations of the same family whose diamond sets were said to be without peer. The company reportedly displayed items valued at $120,000 during the 1872 exhibition. Then there was Henry Sauerbier, a major tool manufacturer and a popular German-American figure in Newark in his time. Sauerbier is best known today for the finely crafted swords he made for the Union Army during the Civil War that remain highly prized by collectors. At the rink, the company that he and, and two of his sons ran exhibited tools for making saddles, shoes, trunks, and more. If anyone is interested in learning more about Sauer here, there's an article on him on my personal website. Exhibiting a dozen oil paintings by lesser known work, Newark artists was the Belgian born Charles Courtois, who had served as a captain in the Civil War with the Union Army's 33rd New Jersey Volunteer Infantry, which was organized in Newark. The popular Newark Tea Trade Company, whose silver trays dominated the American market at the time, exhibited a variety of problems. Exhibits that especially caught the eye of viewers included a harness valued at $10,000 and gold-plated sleigh bells worth up to $200 a set. Also drawing significant attention were displays of seashells fashioned into pyramids, as well as a large circular tower of seven, seven tiers with a flag on top. Creations of Colonel John Benton, a transplanted Englishman. In short, the variety of items put out for view at the exhibition, big trinket, big ticket to trinket to artistic, was about as wide as the mind could imagine. But what took up a substantial amount of space and what many people were most interested in seeing were the machines. Machines that did things, machines that made things. In that respect, the exhibition did not disappoint, mostly because some of the most important names in Newark's long and rich industrial history were operating in the city at the time. Let me give you a few beyond those I've already mentioned. The Clark Thread Company, Heller Brothers, Toolmakers, Jay Wiss, the Cutler Company, the Singer Company for Sewing Machine Fame, Lister Brothers, Manufacturers of Chemicals, and Edward Ballback and Company, the Precious Metal Processors. Also displaying were Thomas Edison's Telegram Company, Thomas Petty's Trunk Making Business, John Jellop's Furniture Business, and of course, the previously mentioned Watts Campbell, manufacturers of steam engines, whose plant that dates 1853 and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places 
sadly remains the case on the harder highway to the without a hint of recognition by Newark's neighbors. Which was taken a couple of weeks ago. William J. Dudley, founder of the still popular shoe brand, Johnston and Murphy, exhibited footwear. And in case anyone might be wondering, his body is lying in an unmarked grave today in Fairmont Cemetery in Central Avenue. To put it simply, this was an all-star cast that turned out to show off its, wear, its wares at the 187, Newark's 1872 Industrial Exhibition. Each item serving in the words of Charles Cummings as a mini ambassador attesting the pride of craftsmanship as well as manner. In all, there were 400 individuals and 200 companies that displayed products, roughly 40% of the companies operating in the city at the time. Some of the firms and people they exhibited more than one item, and 58 of the products were listed as having received a patent. Of the individual exhibitors, 77 were women, and one was African American, a man named Enoch Nelson, the only person listed as colored, who displayed old eardrops and knobs. There's still much to be learned about Nelson, but he was listed in the 1877 city directory as a gold refiner living at 51 Chestnut Street. He also appeared in an 1870 news story as a major player in a city parade mounted by Newark's black residents when African-American men were granted the right to vote. So now let's go over in bullet points an explanation of how the exhibition was organized and how it ran. Everyone in the city was encouraged to exhibit something. And while there was a screening committee, I've yet to come across an account of any rejection. If the screening process had been rigorous, then perhaps the exhibit of a mattress made by a blind man or a jar of fruit that had been preserved for 14 years wouldn't have made the cut. The exhibition was open every day except Sunday. Hours were 9 in the morning until 10.30 at night. Admission was 30 cents, seven dollars today. But proving more popular were advanced tickets at four for a dollar, or a season subscription for three dollars. Children under 19 pay half price, while school groups were also let in at reduced rates, sometimes for free. It was common for employers to buy tickets for their workers. Exhibition space was situated on the rink's upper and lower tiers that were divided into eight distinct display areas. Two newly built wide wooden staircases took visitors to the upper floor. The display areas were split up into these categories, fine arts and education, dwellings, dress and handicap, chemistry and mineralogy, engines and machines, intercommunication, agriculture and horticulture, and finally, tools and art. The board of managers decided the size of each exhibitor's display and its category. Once displayed, an item could not be removed from the hall without the board's permission. Exhibition space was mostly free, but there was a charge for exhibitors selling their products on site. Exhibitors in need were supplied with free steam, power, gas, and wood. No medals or prizes were handed out at the exhibition in, attempt, in an attempt to keep all the exhibits on an equal footing. No explosive materials were allowed inside the exhibition room. Police were on hand at all times, and much to the pleasant surprise of the organizers, no incidents of violence, theft, or vandalism were reported. No vendors selling goods or food of any kind, including alcohol, were permitted inside or immediately outside the ring. There was a restaurant. Over the course of a seven-week run, the exhibition drew more than 120,000 spectators of all social standards. 
as the North Daily Journal observed, the wealthiest and the lowliest mingled together with good democratic freedom. Newspaper accounts estimated the opening night crowd at between 2,000 and 4,000, while daily attendance on select days approached 10,000. To keep interest up, special events were added to the schedule of activities. For example, a grand concert night drew a turnaway crowd of 8,000, and music, in fact, was a continuing added attraction of the exhibition, especially the city's most popular group at the time, Reinhardt's celebrated band. Organizers even had a theme song specifically written for the exhibition that began with these lyrics. Now glory to the working man, whose cunning hands, cunning hands today have brought the wondrous things we see spread out in grand array. Bruce Springsteen, we got the lyrics, you just put it to music. <laughs> Another major attraction inside the ring was a mammoth marble fountain that was filled with goldfish fish, and sprayed water at a height of 25 feet. That's it in the um, red triangle on the left. To add to the ambiance, hundreds of gas jets shielded by glass covers showered the exhibition in a variety of colors, a light show, if you will, and there was a constant changing out of floral arrangements. Streamers and buntings of varying tints and tones were hung everywhere, while pennants and flags from England, France, Germany, and other countries were suspended from the rafters of the building's arched roof alongside the American flag. The look of the exhibition on the whole was so wondrous that one of the local papers described the ring as, quote, a veritable temple of industries. As president of the exhibition, Marcus Ward, a 59-year-old former governor of New Jersey and the son of a soap and candle maker, spoke at both the opening and closing ceremonies. In his opening night speech, he touted what he called Newark's, quote, intelligent, and artistic labor, end quote, and said government should do whatever it could to support the mechanic parts, especially, quote, the young struggling manufacturer, end quote, out of whose ranks have come many captains of industry. On closing night, Ward boasted that the exhibition had proven that, quote, our manufacturers and mechanics are acknowledged to have new equals in both security. General Thomas Runyon, a Civil War veteran had, who had lost the war in New Jersey's 1865 gubernatorial election, delivered the opening night's keynote address. Though long and often tedious, his, his speech is highly informative in its recounting of Newark's manufacturing history. The closing night's keynote presentation was given by Cortland Parker, a nationally renowned lawyer who served as president of the American Bar Association. His speech was masterful and highly recommended. In the blueprint he laid out for North's future and the emphasis he placed on all forms of education in bringing about that future. Organizers did whatever they could to spread the word of the, of the exhibition, both inside and outside of North. Heads were taken out in the press, many of them proclaiming Newark the Birmingham of America, a reference to Birmingham, England, often hailed as the birthplace of manufacturing. Organizers not, not only had a special press night for reporters to view the exhibition, they also kept a press room available on site throughout the event for reporters to gather, socialize, and work. The strategy paid off. With, with the exhibition covered by all of Newark's print outlets, including its German language newspaper. Many of New Jersey's and the country's leading publications also sent reporters, including newspapers from Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. Influential mainstream periodicals like Scientific American and Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper 
in publications as far from as the Shoe and Leather Reporter and the Harness and Parish Journal provided coverage to. The correspondent from the Philadelphia Inquirer actually wondered in his column why Newark had thought of city-focused exhibition first when, without question, Philadelphia could have mounted a far superior showcase of its local products had it been so pressing. The Board of Managers also catered to VIPs with special viewings. VIPs included foreign dignitaries, representatives from the church, federal officials from Washington, D.C., American diplomats, and political leaders from both inside and outside New Jersey. In keeping with one of the organizers' goal from goals from the outset of their planning, certain charities were given $100, almost $2,500 today at the end of the exhibition. Most of the 11 recipients were hospitals, asylums, or homes for the infirm or disadvantaged, including one called well, Home for the Friendless. Home for the Friendless. Who knew? In the final audit of the exhibition's finances, organizers reported amazing, um, raising more than $41,000, a million dollars today, mostly from ticket sales and subscriptions. Close to $30,000 have been spent on those $750,000 of today's money. A large part of it, I'm putting up the new exhibition things, yes, it's going to be for that along with advertising, printing, and musical expenses. The profit was divided up equally among the shareholders at roughly an 11% return on their money before the, the, the charitable contributions were distributed. It was a yield on investment. The events organizers took uh, great pride in publishing. The highlight of the exhibition, of course, was the visit of President U.S. Grant on September 19th and 20th, 1872, a Thursday and Friday. The trip was mentioned in volume 23 of Grant's papers. Grant was staying at his summer cottage in Long Branch at the time, and Newark was his final stop in a two-day campaign swing in North Jersey that took him first to Elizabeth. Grant was invited to Newark by Marcus Ward but he certainly would have wanted to visit the industrial exhibition because Taurus Greeley had made news that was reported across the country when he toured the rink two days earlier. After leaving Elizabeth and before getting to downtown Newark, Grant and his entourage stopped at a midway point to walk through a crowd of 20,000 well-wishers and potential voters at the annual state agricultural fair at the Waverly Fair. There, the president watched a few horse races, toured the fruit tent, and visited the cattle exhibit. At both the fair and industrial exhibition, Grant, attired in nothing but black during the visit, was greeted with an enthusiasm that bordered on frenzy. When he got to the city's court, Grant stopped first at the home of Marcus Ward on Washington Street, where he would be spending the night of the 19th. Moore Ward Mansion was located where the North Museum of Art sits today, and one of life's terrific little ironies. The museum is where Grant's great grandson, Ulysses Grant Beats, would later work as a curator for many years. After being greeted by local dignitaries settling in and then having dinner, President Grant set out for an evening visit to the exhibition. At the rink, the New York Times reported, quote, Ladies waved their handkerchiefs along the galleries, and the crowds of men pushed hither and thither, shouting until they were hoarse, the whole forming a tumultuous and exciting scene. The North Daily Advertiser noted that some people arrived early that afternoon with, with lunch baskets at hand, quote, resolved to remain and secure seats, see the president, or die in the attempt. There were so many politicians, local officials, and onlookers, and mothers with babies to be kissed, squeezing into the venue. But while Grant did manage to work his way through most, most of the exhibition space, 
it was felt he hadn't had a sufficient opportunity to visit and look at the actual exhibits. So a return visit was scheduled for the next day before Grant went back to Long Branch. On the night of his visit, the exhibition's board of managers reported pulling in $2,000 in receipts, almost $50,000 in today's money. The president's visit to an half empty exhibition hall on Friday, September 20th, for what the New York Times described as a quote, leisurely examination and quote of exhibits started at around noon and included lunch. You have to wonder whether Grant during his visit to Newark had a chance to meet with Thomas Marine, whose paintings and illustrations had helped convince Grant and the Congress earlier that same year to establish Yellowstone, the Yellowstone area as the nation's first national park. Grant spoke, Grant spoke briefly to the throng, throng assembled in the rink on the night of his first visit, saying in some, quote, I am happy to be here tonight to witness this display of Newark's manufacturers. This far famed city of Newark has done well. The excellency of your manufacturers is working a large influence on the importation of foreign manufacturing. I heartily thank you for this great pleasure. Arriving back at the Ward Mansion for the night's rest, Grant was received by what must rank as one of the more remarkable scenes in New York's long history. Outside the home, right out here, a welcoming crowd estimated at between 15 and 20,000 people had gathered over the course of the evening in what the New York Daily Herald called, quote, a grand political demonstration. The rally included a torchlight procession numbering in the thousands that filed in front of the ward residence on Washington Street, filing in the view. The marchers who converged onto Washington Park from different parts of the city mostly represented civic, political, and military organizations. Captain Courtois alone leading a contingent of 4,000. Black groups participated as well. The throng exhorted Grant to speak, the president obliged. Once again, though, he was very brief and not particularly memorable in his words, noting that all he had a chance to say at the exhibition that night were human beings. The rally's major speech making was left to Frederick P. Friedenheisen, a Norker who was a U.S. Senator from New Jersey at the time and later Secretary of State under President Chester Arthur. The statue. Grant was so impressed with what he saw in Newark in 1872 that he returned the following year to take in the city's second exhibition. Meanwhile, Horace Greeley had passed away at age 61 several weeks after losing the November election before the Electoral College had met, marking the only time in American history a major presidential candidate died before the election process. There are memorials to Greeley across the country today, including two statues in Manhattan. Even without the leadership of Marcus Ward, who'd been elected to Congress in November 1872, the second industrial exhibition in 1873, according to some accounts, may have equal or even been better than the first and perhaps drew wider attention. In his book, The Industrial Interests of Newark, published in 1874, author William F. Ford had this to say of the 1873 showcase. That a single city could present so great an array of manufactured articles was a cause of general wonder and astonishment. The effect was such that many Europeans engaged in studying American institutions made special visits to the exposition. And thus, the fame of Newark's manufacturers was carried to European shores. Showing up in Newark on trips separate from Grants in 1873 were two of the Union Army's most famous Civil War commanding officers, William Tecumseh Sherman 
and George Armstrong customer. Grant had, urged, Grant had urged Sherman to attend the event, and Sherman did so in full military uniform as commanding general of the United States Army. While Custer was an invited guest whose visit came three years before his death at the Battle of the Big One. In one of the stranger twists of Newark's entire industrial exhibition history, 16 chiefs from the Cheyenne and Arapaho Native American tribes included a stop at the rink in 1873 while on a peacemaking mission to Washington, D.C. One of the local papers described their tour of the exhibition as follows. At first, the visitors were stoical and indifferent, but in the hands of the managers, they soon melted into good humor and appeared interested and pleased. As a memento of their tour, the chiefs were each given a chain and a special medallion to wear around their necks with the exhibition's title appearing on one side of the keepsake and their names individually engraved on the other. Years later, the son of the exhibition secretary, Albert Holbrook, ran into one of the 16 chiefs, Wild Tom, at a detention camp at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and was amazed to find the chief with the medallion from the North Exhibition draped around his neck. A newspaper reported that when the younger Holbrook approached Wild Hog and told him who his father was, Wild Hog, quote, embraced him with true Indian cordiality and treated him with the greatest honor. The most prominent of the chiefs visiting Europe in 1863 was Little Holbrook, who remains a revered figure in Native American culture. The second exhibition was also noteworthy because it was held during the nation's financial panic of 1873, which saw foreign investment in America shrink, banks collapse, and railroads fall. Prospering as it was, Newark's industry was not immune to the economic turn, turn down that swept the country and the city's industrial exhibitions in the ensuing years were severely impacted. In 1874, one of the New York newspapers wrote this, that year's North Industrial Exhibition, while noting a steep decline in attendance. The novelty of the thing to a great extent has worn away. By 1875, the North Industrial Institute that was created in the immediate aftermath of the first industrial exhibition to promote North business and to run the exhibitions had closed its doors and the annual showcase was open to products from outside the city. The North Industrial Institute, by the way, operated from quarters built for it on Washington Street, adjacent to the ring. There was no local exhibition in 1873, with Norfers opting instead to display their wares at the nation's centennial exhibition in Philadelphia. Despite these setbacks, North did con continue holding industrial exhibitions with the event moving to the first Frenchman Armory on Sus Sussex Avenue at some point, while the rink was turned into entertainment facility. For the next hundred years, on and next to the spot where the rink had stood at Court Marshall in Washington Streets, there was a venue, there was a series of venues for live theater, vaudeville, music, and movies. That was before Lewis, Lewis Danson cleared the problem and changed the street layout to accommodate the now departed Star Ledger and its move a few blocks over from Halsey Street in the mid 1960s. After the industrial exhibitions, the rink with its contour, little change, became the Grand Opera House, then the Columbia Theater, Jacobs Theater, and then the Family Theater. Some of the country's outstanding performers and theatrical companies performed there, including the previously mentioned Edward Booth, considered the premier actor of his day, and who was also the brother of Lincoln assassin John Lynch. Built later, immediately adjacent to the rink on Washington Street, closer to Port Street, was the Orpheum Theater. Here's the head from Edward Booth. 
built later immediately adjacent to the reef, the reef on Washington Street, close to Court Street, was the Orpheum Theater, where Jack Johnson, the great black former heavyweight champion, sang to back houses and, and boxed exhibitions, a few brave audience members during a week of shows in November 1925. The theater was later renovated and went for 26 years as the North Opera House of Montclair resident Albert Saragon. The place drew some of Europe's biggest stars, including Carlo Puti, considered the Frank Sinatra of Italy. The North Opera House was demolished in 1863, making way for the Star Ledger, and thus ending the extended era where that one small corner of North reigned as the focal point of city entertainment. North continued holding ex industrial exhibitions, including some into the early 20th century. By 1912, with the progressive era in America well underway, and North now hailing itself as a progressive city with a mindset less conservative than in years past, the exhibition had officially become an exposition, now with awarding of prizes for exhibits. At this point, the event was under the supervision of the North Board of Trade which proudly stated in a 1912 promotional brochure that Newark enjoyed greater per capita industrial wealth than any city in the country. By then, Newark had a whopping 2,000 factories, what was described as a skilled workforce of 76,000 and an, an annual industrial output of $220. This map shows, this map of New York shows how concentrated the factories were. There was another ex exposition with 250 exhibitors held at the Sussex Avenue Armory in 1916 in conjunction with the city's 250th anniversary that got considerable notice in the press as part of the citywide celebration. Then President Woodrow Wilson was represented at the 1916 event by his Secretary of War, Newton Baker. The final exhibition I saw advertised was held in 1922 and was pretty much the last one, although the idea did not fall together at all. By that time, an effort was in place to set up a year-round industrial exhibition site at a building to be constructed on a plot of land on Broad Street directly across from Washington. The city had originally intended that the parcel be used for a building commemorating Newark's 250th anniversary. Lewis Aronson of Art Metalworks and Ronson Leiter fame, who won the prize for best exhibit at the 1912 exposition which was the driving force behind the project. In formulating what he wanted for the great exposition building as the year-round showcase was dubbed by the Sunday Call in Newark, Aronson visited numerous similar type structures around the country. He also set up a corporation to own the business, the building, and operate the lease venture. He was quoted as saying at the time, all of my life, I have striven to do everything in my power to help in the upbuilding of Newark. I believe this building will meet every need of Newark's future industrial development. It was conceived with that in mind and will be operated entirely toward that end. The building was officially to be named Newark's permanent exhibition, exposition. And it was initially envisioned with room enough on three tiers in a glass roof central court for 700 displays in space to be rented out to exhibitors. Later expanded to six and then eight stories. The building was designed by Newark architects, Frank Rad and Henry Baker, who, the same, who in the same span also designed the nearby Salon Temple, which later was called the Mosque Theater what we know today, Symphony Hall. Groundbreaking on the $4.5 million permanent industrial exposition building was held in March 1925 and was completed the following year with seven times the exhibition space of the ring. But before it opened to great fanfare, the building's concept shifted from being strictly an exhibition center to primarily an office building, and its name was changed to the industrial office. I've yet to find an account publicly explaining 
the reason behind the change of plan. The office building was said to be the largest structure of its kind in the state when it was finished. And it attracted many prestigious tenants over the years, including federal and state governmental agencies, courts, legal and accounting firms, and prominent businesses like New York Telephone and Western Electric. The governor of New Jersey had an office there, as did the Anti-Saloon League of New Jersey. And next door was New York's famous Essex House. But right from the beginning, the office building was plagued with financial problems, which later forced its foreclosure, sold at least a couple of times, and even abandoned. At one point, New York City Councilman Calvin West suggested it be used for Essex County College. The reason most often given for the building, building's failure what it was, was that it was too far from the Essex County Courthouse and North Central Business. Today, the old industrial office building is the main building of Essex Plaza Senior Citizens Complex. Thankfully, left intact on its exterior walls during renovations were symbols of industrial newer that were part of the building's original design. In all likelihood, they're the only surviving public reminders of the city's entire 50-year industrial exhibition experience. So, was Newark's industrial exhibition of 1872 worthwhile? Like my view, the answer would be a resounding yes. It surely raised the city's profile as well as its level of self confidence, both immediately and immeasurably. We set the stage for future exhibitions over the course of the next half century. Who's to say it didn't inspire a new generation of inventors, investors, business people? No doubt the exhibition also gave an economic lift to Newark's expanding manufacturing base that in turn provided jobs to a local population that continued growing dramatically into peaking at just below 450,000 in 1930. In a grudging second look at Newark, it was published at the end of 1872 the direct result of the industrial exhibition, the New York Times applauded Newark's many attributes in a long three-column article, even acknowledging that Newark's economy was stronger than New York's on a comparative basis. Yes, Newark is certainly a go-ahead place when in business, domestic, social, and every other life times really, in sharp context, contrast with the unflattering story printed in August. What the paper failed to note on second glance was that Newark was already in the midst of addressing some of the weaknesses cited in the first story. One example was the opening of the city's first high caliber hotel, the Continental, and brought in Vision Streets near the Morris and Essex Railroad Station in 1872. The city was also upgrading another modern and one more small measure of that progress brought her own 12 miles of sewer lines in Newark in 1870. That number quadrupled over the next decade, kept expanding to more than 300 miles. But viewed in the bigger picture, the exhibitions can be seen as real life, real time reflections of a cultural, political, and economic transformation in Newark that transformed, that, I'm sorry, that propelled the city to the forefront of American cities over the last half of the 19th century. And into the 20th. The renowned free public library, a museum, a technical school that evolved into a university, a marvelous park system, a still envied water system, an electric trolley line, tube service in and out of New York, construction of wide tree lined streets, construction of new roadways and bridges, the self proclaimed best street lighting in America. Real estate that kept increasing in value and a thriving art scene, along with other advances, all came about as a result of seismic change in the way the city saw itself and conducted business during the exhibition era. To play off the title of Brad Tuttle's book, How Newark Became Newark, this truly was the time when Newark became the famous, bustling, booming Newark that we still see vestiges of. Vestiges of and know to some extent that 
So it should come as no surprise that 10 years after the first exhibition, what had been seen in 1872, that the risk-laden experiment was already being looked back upon, not just in nostalgic terms, but in historic terms as well. This is what one of the local newspapers wrote of the first showcase in retrospect. Every citizen of Newark remembers with pleasure the exhibition. And there were few probably who could not recall, like a pleasant dream, the almost fairy like spectacle of the great thing. The cases of blazing diamonds, the pyramid of shells, canopies, torches, the whirling and whirring machinery, the beautiful display of industries, the paintings and statuary, the music rising and swelling or growing fainter as the listener, following the great, the gay throng, drew near or past from his vicinity. The gala nights, when distinguished visitors have come back again and re entertained Newark's highest honors, President of the United States, the venerable competitor, whose pale face of silver frame we have never seen. The paper continued. Those were glorious days and nights for him. He reflected more credit upon the originators and managers of the grand enterprise than ever be expressed. They added more to the renown of our fair city than any in the previous years. All honor, say we, to the men who have pushed forward this great enterprise. Their sacrifice and zeal and Herculean labors merit and will receive a lasting remembrance of the whole community. They should and will stand in the history of Newark as the greatest for public actors. We will receive lasting remembrance of the people. Thank you for sharing your time with me this evening as we continue with that lasting remembrance in the city's 1872 industrial exhibition. Hundred and fifty years later. Hi there. Um, I, I don't know if uh, people need a bathroom break or or whether. <laughs> what? I have to mute this. Okay, I'm not. I'm not understand. Well, but we want to hear him. You don't need to hear me. How do we hear him? Start talking, Ezra. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I, I feel as if we probably I should give people a, a bathroom break or five minutes, but um, I, I don't know. Uh, of course, you have the luxury of of stretching, and um, I won't think you're rude to stand up and stretch because I'm not uh, there in the room with you. Um, but my talk is only 20, 20 minutes long, um, and uh, um, I will I will be as brief and quickly as I as I as I as I can. Because <laughs> I, I know it's late, and I'm sure people want a dinner or something else like that um, if they didn't have it yet. Uh, <clears throat> so to share my screen with you, here we go. In some way, uh, I was made in Newark, even though I was born across the river, because I borrowed this phrase and advertising gambit of Bambergers for the title of my first book. And to write and conduct my dissertation research, I relied on the knowledge and generosity of the late William Dane, 
Charles Cummings, and a few luminaries still here with us, Ulysses Dietz and William Penniston, many, many thanks. Between the 1870s and the 1920s, spectacular exhibitions in department stores, including Wanamaker's in Philadelphia, Filene's in Boston, Kaufman's in Pittsburgh, were at the forefront of commercial innovation and urban energy in very tangible ways. Reading turn of the century newspapers, you feel the city growing by leaps and bounds and the thrill of stores as social forums and places to watch, for example, the production of novel industrial art. Here, John Kunzman in Bambergers in 1925. The stores made in Newark exhibitions in the first quarter of the 20th century featured art pottery, as well as the wondrous novelty of peanut butter and all sorts of other goodies, and a representative of Whitehead and Hogue sat by the door with a machine to stamp out these very buttons. Chester Hogue and Lewis Bamberger were trustees of the Newark Public Library and the Newark Museum Association. That synergy and collaboration is what drew me in to Newark's story. The vases that Fulper produced as well as the spring back button invented new in Newark were industrial art to adorn and reconceptualize the city. I hope to unpack this catch-all term tonight. Like manufacturers, which bridges machine and hand, literally in terms of the terminology, the complexities uh, are obscured by today's aesthetic categories. The cultural institutions of the era recognized that they were not as popular as industrial exhibitions, world's fairs, and department stores. Here in Newark, collaboration aimed to close the gap, even though many fine art museums viewed commerce in a more negative light. One of the peculiarities of Newark's municipal exhibitions was local boosterism. Another enigma was the question of which trades are artistic and which goods require skill. There was a high estimation of both handicraft and the wonder of mechanization simultaneously in the mix. The only artifact that was in Bambergers made in Newark exhibitions that is in the British Museum today is this spring back button invented by Whitehead and Hogue. So stop back, let's so, so stand back and let's, let's think about how advertising, innovative advertising, <clears throat> Uh, as well as other things like engravings and statues were within the umbrella of industrial art. The best documentation of these exhibitions remains the catalog that, that Guy mentioned from 1873. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, that's when it was actually printed, the year of Newark's second industrial exhibition that ended prematurely after only two weeks when the panic of 1873 derailed the celebration. And the catalog is our record of which objects were exhibited and by whom. The representative image of the industrial exhibition would grow more narrowly defined as a virile laborer in the 20th century. But as Guy said, in the 19th century, there was an ample mix of women demonstrators. These posters from the 20th century show that Newark revived its industrial exhibitions periodically and maintained the Newark only restriction and that the museum, when it was finally chartered in 1909, adhered to this notion of championing New Jersey products. Looking back to 1872's first iteration of Made in Newark, we need to ask, is this geographic restriction a sign of an inferiority complex or an assertion of local patriotism? Two, we should note the variety in manufacturing, wax leaves and facsimiles of flowers exhibited as industrial art, things we would not classify as such today. Three, Newark celebrated handicraft and mechanization at the same time. Reviews in New, York's, in New York City's newspapers imply the Newark exhibition had a high profile in the larger region, suggesting Newark sought fair recognition for its achievements. Living in Manhattan's shadow, the restriction was an intentional strategy to cope with being both close and at a remove from the nation's commercial capital. Even if we see that the New York Evening Post misspelled the name of Hughes and Phillips, we should grasp this important company was a household name. Hughes and Phillips had converted tens of thousands of muskets from flintlocks to percussion caps during the Civil War. And after gaining large government contracts had expanded to a variety of heavy machinery and precision tools. 
Hughes and Phillips sponsored the exhibition and their steam engines drove the shafts and leather belts that powered exhibitions of other machinery in the hall. In 1872, they did not exhibit firearms, but hydrants, brass goods, and even <clears throat> engravings, artistic engravings that had nostalgically commemorated the early steam engine made by Newark inventor Seth Boyd and also the Monitor, the Civil War ironclad ship built in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, that was so important as a Union symbol, despite its poor result design, uh, resulting in, in, in its foundering in, in high waves <clears throat> after only five years of, of, of sailing. The New York Times review of 1872 is magnificently instructive. The trunk you travel with is nine cases out of 10 of Newark manufacturer. The hat you wear was made there, the buttons on your coat, the shirt on your back, your brush, the tinware you use in your kitchen, the oil cloth you walk on, the harness and bit you drive with, all owe to Newark their origin. And as for your wife's chain bracelets, earrings, and pendants, they have been fashioned by some cunning Newark goldsmith. A rare moment, Manhattan recognizes Newark's manufacturer's right to boast. A variety of handicraft and emergent mass production collided in Newark's fair, as we see on this page. Henry Weeks showing gilt picture frames, Miss Minnie Dunker exhibiting ladies' underwear, Heller and Mertz, a company recently formed by German Americans, one of whom was a graduate of Cooper Union, would make America's first synthetic ultramarine, a dye used in tinting wallpaper, paints, and textiles. DeWitt Stevens exemplifies range in exhibiting both a tool to remove hot embers safely from the stove, as well as artistic plaster portraits of people and dogs. <coughs> Pianoforte and carriages were on display, as well as ornamental sugar work an 18th century craft that was being displaced slowly by porcelain statuary. Heinz and Sons made telephone pianos. Whoop, I'm sorry, a little out of sequence there. Heinz and Sons made telephone pianos equipped with a Chinese and Turkish gong attached to the soundboard to reverberate and amplify. <clears throat> and I'll actually just go back just to suggest, I, I threw these in at the last minute, obviously not that uh, uh, coordinated, but just to show you, uh, the very few museums actually have such wax flowers preserved. The VNA has one here. These were made in 1875 and sold directly to the museum. And yet it was a, a, a phenomenally um, um, uh, you know, popular art. Uh, this made by a male artist. Most of the wax flowers uh, in, in, in Newark in 1872 exhibited by, 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 by women artists. Um, <clears throat> At the very bottom of the page, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, is the only artist we still recognize on that page by name today, Lily Spencer. Lily Martin Spencer had exhibited oil paintings in New York since 1848, after coming from Cincinnati. And in the 1850s, the Paris firm of Goupil had turned her pictures into hundreds of thousands of prints that they sold very profitably. Despite becoming a household name for genre images, uh, some of them racist and quite uh, 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 you know, uh, ugly in some ways. Uh, by 1872, Newark was a bit out of step with the affluent, uh, Spencer, excuse me, was a bit out of step with the affluent post-war market and the enormous canvases exhibited by landscape artists like Bierstadt and Church. Lily Martin Spencer's uh, paintings exhibited in the 1872 exhibition are notable because she had been praised in her 30s as a novel professional type, the American woman, the, the woman artist who embodied America's democratic possibility. These two paintings were later hung in the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition in the Women's Pavilion, a distinct women's pavilion and the separation of industrial and fine art would increase from 1876 on. But let's pause to admire the painting of Miss Vivian in relation to the production of Ultramarine Blue by Heller and Mertz. Spencer, who was always spoken of in relationship to her childhood on, a child, on, an, on that Ohio farm, was the breadwinner in her large family. Of her 13 children, only seven lived to adulthood. Her sympathetic portraiture of children remains noteworthy, especially her Newark patron, Marquis Ward, <clears throat> and, and her port, portrait of, of, of those children made in 1858 is of course in, in Newark's wonderful museum. 
She probably moved to Newark for Ward's patronage. <clears throat> and yet, as she wrote her mother, quote, fame is as hollow and brilliant as a soap bubble. It is all colors outside and nothing worth kicking at inside. Spencer painted in obscurity the last decades of her life before she died in 1902, never emerged from poverty. And in the course of conducting research for this talk, I realized that her painting of Fanny Colley Fithian might very well have changed meaning from when she painted it in her Manhattan studio rental in 1869 to exhibiting it in 1872. Scholars suggest that Spencer criticizes fashion without ridiculing it. Note the acreage of blue satin, <clears throat> the miles of lace trimming. She documents the incredible materialism of the era, as well as the ways that women were ensconced in very circumscribed roles. But what's most interesting to me about this painting, and I only discovered this through your prodding of inviting me, is that it likely remained in her possession <clears throat> because Fanny Connolly Fithian's uh, uh, father, father failed to pay Spencer for the portrait. Richard Connolly, otherwise known in the newspapers at the time as Slippery Dick, had been the comptroller of New York City in the Tammany Hall political machinery when the portrait was painted. But by 1872, Slippery Dick had fled to Europe after being charged with embezzlement like his buddy, the infamous Boss Tweed. Did this painting that was still in Spencer's possession shift from genre, shift genre from portrait to allegory? The artist's speculative industrial art mirrors the metaphor of the ephemeral rose and the short duration of beauty and life. Spencer aged 50 at the time of the Newark exposition also exhibited truth unveiling falsehood, <clears throat> a kind of drama of good and bad motherhood, which a critic savaged as quote, a farrago of allegorical and metaphysical balderdash. No American painter yet made a living from such mythological imagery. Painters sold portraiture, still lifes, and especially landscapes like Moran. There were a dozen other painters exhibiting in 1872, all forgotten today aside from her and Moran, and more than a dozen makers of wax flowers and other artificial vegetation in some of Newark's patented novel materials like synthetic leather. leather. And I should add that the, the wax flowers might also have been made of paraffin, a new, a new petroleum-based wax. <clears throat> Thomas Petty sponsored the show as well as exhibiting in it. Petty is still remembered in the city today by the 1888 church that bears his name. The Glaswegian born entrepreneur's fortune and church was built upon his 1869 trunk patent. Jacob Wiss, another immigrant was also flourishing in Newark in 1872. When I was a child, my mother still asked for, my grandmother still asked for Wiss scissors, the brand name bearing weight, Wiss exhibited alongside patent mosquito bars, as you see at the top, along with spice flowers, whatever those are. And Wiss scissors remain for sale today. Their special aviator snips are still made in the US, in North Carolina, while the cheaper sort of goods made um, are made, uh, sold by Walmart, as you see here, are made in China. To step back and to contextualize Newark's exhibition, we need to admire the industrial exhibition as a 19th century vogue for an edutainment that began in 1851 in London <clears throat> with this idea of an international paradise of commodities that might supplant actual warfare. <clears throat> the contrast of local versus exotic goods and novel forms of handicraft flourishing with increased mechanization can be seen in architect Joseph Paxton commissioning 300,000 panes of glass for the Crystal Palace, at the time more glass than had ever been made in England. Historian Raphael Samuel identifies this paradox whereby mechanization increases novel form of handicraft. 19th century capitalism created more skills than it destroyed. Chance Brothers won the contract for the Crystal Palace and made the largest sheet of glass ever made yet in England, 10 inches by 49 inches, right? 
not as big as a door today. The cylinder process, you get a sense of here, <coughs> was made by blowing, slicing, and unfolding glass. Glass was the premier material. Osler's glass fountain at the center of the Crystal Palace was 27 feet high, four tons of pink glass. A colossal cut candelabra made on this scale was first made in 1847 for Ibrahim Pasha, the Egyptian general who had commissioned Osler to produce one for the tomb of Mohammed at Medina. These were the largest glass lighting devices ever produced. And seeing Osler's work, Queen Victoria ordered some. 1851 was also the first time a work of American art made an international stir. Hiram Powers' Greek slave that you see on the right. The Greek slave has been written about at great length. I mention it here mainly to show how it enigmatically straddles the spheres of industrial art and fine art, which would become two different exhibition galleries by 1876. In 1872, Newark is still working within this 1851 mindset where Colt's guns, McCormick's Reapers and the Greek slave are all together in the American section. An English critic berated Americans, quote, they sent us some choice specimens of slaves. We have the Greek slaves captive in dead stone. Why not the Virginia slave living in, Eb in living ebony, close quote. John Tenniel, of course, turned this into a biting caricature of American hypocrisy. Americans also exhibited a double patent grand piano, a musical and decorative spectacle upon which four performers executed compositions arranged for eight hands. The Greek slave, an update of the Medici Venus, represented a Christian girl captured by Turks during the Greek War of Independence. As the most celebrated work of art of the 19th century, it provoked both ecstatic praise and puritanical Jeremiah's. The Greek slave also inspired a flood of merchandise in a variety of media from daguerreotypes and engravings to plaster and porcelain figurines. Powers' six marble versions that he made and a sampling of the hundreds of thousands of reverberating representations show how industrial art spawned more industrial art. <clears throat> in direct emulation of London, a crystal palace arose in New York City in 1853. The Greek slave is shown there too. In both London and New York, Colt's firearms were a premier display. The pistols were a technological triumph and also considered fine decoration and an eye-catching show. <clears throat> the elevator break, elevator safety break that Otis exhibited is often memorialized as prescient of the city skyscrapers. In reality, his sales through 1860 totaled just 27 elevators. If Otis is remembered as the founder of the elevator, his patent sat on the technolo technology shelf. It was not an immediate paradigm shift. <clears throat> Often less is paid to the local mechanics fairs and industrial fairs and agricultural fairs already ongoing since the 1830s and 40s. Boston's Mechanics Hall, like Newark's in 1872, was an indoor skating rink when not in use for exhibitions. And at the Massachusetts exhibitions, there were a variety of similar goods, both saddles for horses and velocipedes or bicycles. Boston was still an important port and its retailers displayed imports unlike Newark. The 1876 Centennial Fair exhibition in Philadelphia was when fine art and industrial art became distinctly segregated the fair remained a mode of visualizing competition through commodities. And you can see the very racialized, racially charged uh, uh, par, uh, uh, arrangement of figures there. Uh, <clears throat> the author of the volume on industrial art, Walter Smith, author of Massachusetts Art Curriculum and director of the Massachusetts Normal School, now Massachusetts Coll College of Art and Design where I teach, trained both artisans and art teachers. In Philadelphia in 1876, Smith exhibited drawings by his students that expose his mission to serve both industry and art. Drawings of machinery, decorative radiator covers, and plaster casts, notably by women artists in training. But in 1876, the real, the real excitement was generated by the Corliss engine, revered as artful industry. 
On the sidelines, <clears throat> fine art statues continued to refer to social changes of the day. Here, the emancipation of the Negro and Daniel Chester French visualizing the mythical agrarian freedom fighter of Concord in Lexington instead of the merchants who funded the insurgency. The most popular display in Philadelphia was the waterworks, an artificial Niagara Falls. The hand of the Statue of Liberty was a noted attraction seeking subscriptions to fund the pedestal's completion. Having surveyed this variety of spectacles, all of them industrial art, let us return to Lily Martin Spencer's paintings and ponder them as alternative messages to progress. While it is entirely speculation, I think that in 1872, Spencer might very well have invented the title We Both Must Fade as a self-aware commentary on the explosion of materialism and the irrationally exuberant luxuries abounding at the fair and in everyday life. It also at the age of 52 and her shift over to Newark might have described her own uh, uh, sense of her own career. If truth unveiling falsehood suggests art as an antidote to materialism, so does we both must fade. <clears throat> Instead of thinking about Newark's fair as a place where consensus was achieved, we can think of Spencer visualizing the New York Times description of the cunning Newark Smith who fashions guilt accessories that bind us and yes, sometimes blind us. An updated We Both Must Fade would show today's contemporary museum goer in suspended animation looking at cell phone, perhaps admiring Facebook likes and simultaneously worrying about wasting precious time. If you are hesitant, to consider Spencer a maker of philosophical art and stuck seeing her as many have as a painter of merely sentimental imagery, then I will conclude by identifying the paradox of industrial art in the most famous American philosophy. You see before you a pencil made by Henry David Thoreau who spent months in Harvard's library researching how to improve his father's factory and yet who avoided commenting honestly on his own fascination with machinery and industrialization. In 1847, the Massachusetts Charitable Mechanics Association Fair awarded a prize to John Thoreau and son for their lead pencils. This was the year that Henry David Thoreau reflected on the quote, simple life, as he lived rent-free on Emerson's woodlot beside Walden Pond. The value of industrial art in America is a longstanding dilemma. We rarely stop to think about the mechanics who make things like pencils and iPhones until our supply chains break. But one I've been happy to reflect upon this evening as we might do well to accept that we are all the children of the engineer, like it or not, and children in an engineered world. Our misunderstandings and our understandings of technologies still shape our moral philosophies so reckoning with tangible things like buttons and jewelry <clears throat> remains a tonic to our tendency to abstraction, both in the categorization of art as well as other values. Thank you. Thank you, Edra. Thank you, Guy. Uh, Guy, you certainly made the case that you're And Ezra, you added some wonderful context in that, uh, delving more deeply into that interesting combination, but also growing divide between the, the engineer's product and the executive point or artistic product. We have time for just a, a couple questions. I would encourage those of you who are here to grab a, a, a box dinner before you leave. Do have a question uh, now for Ezra or, or Guy? I don't have anything in the chat. Yes, Miriam. I've had the great pleasure this summer and this early fall of looking at 
Craig and James on a, a kind of a companion exhibit uh, looking at um, the 1872 exhibition. And I wanted to sort of tap um, your brain up about your thoughts on the impact the exhibition might have had also on Newark's trajectory, future trajectory beyond, say, the the late, the eight, the you know latter half of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. Um, that's something we've talked about. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, looking back at the exhibition vantage point of a person in 2022, right? Um, what you know? What are your thoughts about its legacy? Well, first, I would refer you to Portland uh, Barker's. A speech at the, uh, the closing, the keynote speech at the closing night. You have to read it. It's about what he sees for North's future and how North should get there. Uh, it, North doesn't realize uh, what he had hoped it would, uh, but I think you know certain parts of the city's uh, advancements, you know, did kind of start and move ahead, but not. It wasn't fully realized what Parker had in mind. But um, you know, the city continued to industrialize, heavily industrialize after 1872, you know, right up to the Depression. Um, in 1872, I, I'm not even sure that, that you know, North was, uh, you know, what percentage North was, you know, functioning industrially compared to, you know, the, the remaining years up to the, the Depression. But uh, my sense is that the momentum was still good. But I would definitely recommend reading that speech because it's just beautiful and what he sets out and you almost read it and say what a nice thing that it happens right I, I guess one of the things we wonder if I have right to say this I, I don't need to think to that did Newark end up in some ways boxing itself into a corner by branding itself as an industrial city right and sort of pursuing that line you know, my sense is that probably could, that could well be the case. And again, you know, why not build on your strengths? This might be a point to bring Ezra in. Uh, Ezra, I think some of the things in the progressive era, Ezra, I think some of the developments in the uh, progressive era, the museum, the library, and some of the other things were building on this, but trying to imagine a, a larger or greater vision for for the world. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's um, it's it's both easy and difficult to look, it's easy to look back with 2020 hindsight. Um, you know, teaching here in Boston, I I often point out to my students that that um, that Boston's Customs House was the tallest skyscraper built uh, in 1916, and then the next building that went up and superseded it was in 1966. The Prudential, <laughs> which is of course Newark's. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I think you know that's one way to describe. I mean, cities are very strange uh, um, in, in that sort of way that you know there is no Chrysler Building, there is no Empire State Building here in Boston, even though there was ample funds to build such structures. Um, so I think that that um, I think that. Newark does remarkably well with in the in the progressive era. It it does, uh, I, I think, actually, you know, it 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 it, it it's it's manufacturing in some ways. It, it finally puts an infrastructure within its manufacturing. So so that we you know for those of us who are concerned with with environmentalism today, you can really say that you know the 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 kind of some things were heavy handed, like the draining of the swamps, but the, the, the sewage and, and road work that was put in then, of course, is still what we're living with today. Uh, I mean, here in Boston, too, I can look out my window and I can see the, uh, the, the, the T that was built in 1930 and that <laughs> has not been improved upon, unfortunately, since then. So, um, you know, th there are ways in which I, I think it's, it's hard to say that, that, uh, that, that, that Newark goes wrong through any fault of its own. Or through a lack of planning, I think if anything, planning, city planning really booms, especially uh, at the at the public library under John Cotton Dana. I wrote in the chat that Guy showed one of the slot one of the slides that Guy made uh, showed 
was uh, a map of the, where the factories were in the city that was actually signed and drawn by John Cotton Dana. You would never actually, as a librarian, probably sign your own work today so visibly, but he, uh, he was very proud of his work and, um, and the kind of collaboration that was going on in, in the teens and 20s was remarkable between uh, the different parts of the city. I think we have a question in the back there. Yes. Just a statement and a question. First, congratulations to the planners, and especially the excellent presentation by Mr. Guy Sterling. This history is so important. I gave up two tickets to Yankee Stadium to see the judge was at 61 tonight, so I, you owe me, Mr. Sterling. One observation. I think all of us now can appreciate and understand the mindset of Mayor Kenneth Allen Gibson, when he became mayor in 1970, when he said, and we always quoted, wherever American cities are going, North will get there first with all of this tremendous history tonight. The question I'd like to pose, is it a norm or a day, by the way, there is an underground North that I would hope this committee would explore. When the Mars Canal was built, which is invisible today, the tunnel goes from Washington Street under and comes up, not up, military park. Atlanta has an underground Atlanta. Newark could have an underground Newark, but that's something for your research. The tunnel goes from Washington under military park. He sits there, underground in Newark. Here's my question. With this great history, is it a norm is it an expectation that Newark would move from an industrial giant to a service giant, where Prudential, never abandoned the city of Newark, would go door to door and sell insurance? Uh, we become an insurance town. We become uh, the arts leader. Is that a norm? With this great industrial history behind it, sandwiched between New York and Philadelphia, which you made reference to. What is the expectation of a great city like New York? I think that's the next question we need to pose. Should we have lost the industrial might, or is it an expectation and a norm that we remove from the industry, close the Mars Canal and others, and become a service giant? I think to a large degree that's already happened, but I also think that you might correct me if I'm wrong, that North is still one of the few countries in America that uh, were well, heavy manufacturing in the So we still have an industrial Newark, it's just obviously not, you know, what it was. Uh, but, you know, uh, yeah, so America is going to have to pivot away from heavy manufacturing uh, for any number of reasons, not the least of which is, you know, our future. Thank you, Mayor James. Another question here? Okay. In my community, there's a major call, between call. There's a statue of Franklin Murphy, uh, and it's falling in disarray. Uh, what's up with Franklin Murphy? I became interested in Franklin Murphy when I found out that he was one of the main sponsors of the press school for Bortstown. I went to the historical library board in I didn't find much information on him, but not until I found out that he had a couple of holes. Asbury Hall, the library there, gave me tons of information on Franklin Murphy. Outstanding. He owned a, a large uh, lack of plan down in the East Ward. Uh, he was an ambassador, he was governor of New Jersey. I heard he, he was a close friend of the president, who was Seth Grant. Grant sent his house down by Asbury Hall to Seth Grant. Uh, the county he, he developed the, the watershed, which you know we worked for. Um, he was the one that got the watershed for all that property up there. You know he was the, the leader of that. They shut him out of his seat. That's over early on before he was Franklin Burton before he was really dead. Well, you might try to state our friends, but what government? What's up with Franklin Murphy that day? You know, shut him out of history. Well, 
You might try the state archives because he was governor of New Jersey. You may be in Trenton. I'm not sure. You might try the state archives in Trenton because he was governor. And maybe it's maybe it's down in Trenton. But I agree. He's over a very overlooking figure in North. And the county the whole park system. Yeah. Why is the county that that good question? You know who to ask. I just want to make a, a, a brief comment. As president of Mount Pleasant Cemetery, just about every person you talk about guy is buried in Mount Pleasant Cemetery. And um, so maybe sometime you might want to do an industrial tour of Newark through Mount Pleasant Cemetery with all those people that are the uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate the talk. I, I love the spirit of work industry. I, I am curious, to what extent does, does this, or did the exposition kind of paper over the some of the labor relations, you know, maybe the, the other side of this, you know, the, the lack of harmony in the industry? I'm thinking of if Newark is like America's Birmingham. Birmingham is a city characterized by slum, poverty, labor unrest. You know, to what extent was this exposition kind of trying to push that off to the side or just is that kind of fantastic listen, I'm not gonna you know set myself forth as, as the expert on this but I didn't see any of that. I didn't see anything. I mean I read a lot about fires, people dying in industrial uh, accidents, things like that, but I didn't see any push for any at, at that time uh, around the exhibition for um, you know labor rights and it may have been there but it certainly didn't uh, rear its head at the exhibition. Do you have another question? We may make this the last question. Okay, well, I think a last comment. Um, Guy, do you want to make a comment? And Ezra, if you have a, a, a closing comment. I just want, you know, I, in all my research, there was just one other thing that's not quite uh, germane to the, to the topic, but I just wanted to bring it up because it's so unusual. To me. We talk about the rink where the exhibition was held and how after um, roller skating had kind of diminished as a, a recreational activity, it did other things. Well, it had concerts. It had a lot of theater, had lectures. Um, parties, uh, it, you know, and anything that uh, you could almost think of, but there was one item, one activity that really that just flew off the page when I read. And for those of you who are sports fans, you're going to appreciate this. We would call it race walking, but at the time, they called it pedestrianism, where they had professional people, walkers, who would either walk distances and be timed or be timed for walking distances. So for an example, you could have a race that would last two weeks and they would come into the a venue. It wasn't just here in Newark, but in other venues where they wouldn't walk 24 hours a day over two weeks. There'd be a set time frame where people would walk and then and there would be a competition. And there could be, there were professionals, amateurs, and whoever walked the greatest distance over the course of two weeks, that, you know, they would win the prize. Or it could be that they would have a set distance, say 500 miles, and you'd start your walking, and whoever got there first would be the winner. So, a few days before Christmas in December, 1874, the great pedestrians of America, Edward Payson Weston, with a biography written of him in 2012 called Man in a Hurry. In Newark, New Jersey, before 5,000 spectators roaring in appreciation in the rain, set the record for walking 500 miles in six days. And he made it by 20 minutes, and it had never been done before in America. It was a huge deal because it was a big sport at the time. We don't have it anymore. But he was greeted with a rousing ovation. And he got some money out of it.
<laughs> um, Ezra, uh, a last comment from you. I know that, that somebody added in, in the chat, Carol Jenkins, I think, uh, reminding us about the Newark School of Fine and Industrial Arts uh, that was founded in 1881. But a last comment from you before we thank you and Guy. Uh, just thank you for having me, uh, lovely, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to have COVID and not be there today. <laughs> well, we hope to see you back. Uh, we did. Thank you, and thank you, back.